Um, I'll briefly discuss about the definition of the energy in the features of configuration. But the bulk of my talk will be based on the management of PPHN because that's what we did for most of you. Uh, so, yeah, PPHN is the failure of ordinary vascular resistance to fall fortunately, and this uh, leads to a right leg shunting of the oxygenated blood at atrial, ductal, and pulmonary levels leading to severe hypoxemia and it's quite common and associated with a significant mortality and morbidity. So before we move on to pathophysiology, research, it's important that we understand as to what's happening with the, uh, with the fetal as well as the fetal circulation. Um, right, so during the fetal circulation, um, the main uh, differences in the fetal circulation compared to uh, a newborn um, is the presence of the placenta, which is uh, which is having a very low vascular resistance, and then you have your lungs, um, which is not uh, which is not useful at all and not contributing um, to your oxygenation or uh, ventilation, and therefore the pulmonary vascular resistance is quite high during the fetal life. So what happens is um, the blood coming into the placenta gets oxygenated and this enters uh, the fetal heart through the umbilical vein, via the ductus and getting into the inferior vena cava and into the right atrium. <coughs> and then as this is, <coughs> sorry, this is well oxygenated blood, this is preferably shunted across the foramen ovale and gestated in the fetus. And then, uh, it enters into the uh, ascending aorta and preferably supplies your head and neck area. Um, and then what happens to the blood coming, the deoxygenated blood coming from the SVC? It comes into the RA and preferably goes into the RV and then enters the pulmonary vein. Um, and then uh, thereby, uh, as the pulmonary vascular resistance is pretty high, uh, the majority of this blood flow, about 80% of the blood flow is shunted through the ductus into the descending aorta. And then uh, the lower half of the body receives less uh, oxygenated blood in the fetus. So what happens soon after birth? The low resistance placenta is taken off and therefore the vascular resistance of the systemic circulation goes up. And at the same time, what happens in the pulmonary vasculature is that um, with the aeration of the lungs and also in this, uh, when the uh, oxygenation, when the partial pressure of oxygen of the lungs go, um, goes up, uh, then all of a sudden the pulmonary vascular resistance drops. Therefore, the pulmonary blood flow increases all of a sudden. And then this leads to a reduction in the right ventricular pressure as well. Uh, and then what happens as the pulmonary vascular resistance is now very low, uh, the previously um, blood which was shunting from the right to the left through the ductus, uh, this also reverses and there is shunting of left to right uh, shunting of blood uh, through the ductus. And then uh, now, the, now the aorta is having a higher concentration of oxygen compared to the fetus. And with this higher concentration of blood, what happens is the ductus closes. Those are the major changes that uh, happen um, um, soon after the birth. But sometimes this, these changes, they fail to happen due to various reasons. And that's why we see babies having PPHN or persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So let's see what are the causes which are contributing to this persistence of the fetal circulation or persistence of this high pulmonary vascular resistance. So sometimes it's just the maladaptation or acute vasoconstriction occurring at the level of the uh, pulmonary vessels. Um, so it, there is a general saying that uh, the pulmonary vessels are like an angry wife who is like waiting to get angry all the time. So likewise, what happens is with the slightest insult, if there's an asphyxia, they go into spasm. If there's a component of sepsis, they go into spasm. So in any condition, HIE, pneumonia or neonatal sepsis or meconium aspiration syndrome, due to this maladaptation, there is acute vasoconstriction um, happening at the uh, pulmonary artery level leading to PPHN. 
But then there are some other chronic causes as well. Whenever there is a pulmonary hypoplasia, the underlying vessels uh, also are hypoplastic. The common examples include um, babies with dark rheumatic hernia and also in specific space occupying lesions such as uh, congenital lobe emphysema. And sometimes when uh, babies are having chronic oligohydramnios also, you all know that there, is a, there can be a component of pulmonary hypoplasia. And these leads to PPHN when the baby is born. And sometimes uh, there is a, 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 just a maldevelopment or abnormal remodeling of the vasculature. Again, common is diaphragmatic hernia. And also, this is seen in antenatal ductal closure. So this is seen when mothers take NSAIDs uh, and also serotonin um, receptor re serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, um, as antidepressants. So these babies, they can develop PPHN. And also sometimes there could be an intravascular obstruction uh, whenever there is a polycythemia component like diabetes or um, when there's a hyperviscosity. So what happens when the pulmonary vascular resistance fails to drop? So the pulmonary artery resistance, its uh, artery pressure is high. This is reflected as higher uh, pressure at the RV level. And then there is uh, blood regurgitating into the right atrium. And then there will be right to left shunting across the foramen ovale. And this deoxygenated blood getting into the LA and going into the left atrium. And if there's a VSD, there could be shunting across the VSD as well and slightly deoxygenated blood entering into the uh, aorta and there's a, and there's a huge shunt occurring at the um, level of the ductus as the pulmonary artery resistance is quite high. Okay, so the, those are the changes that we see in PPH in babies. So what are the key clinical features? So they remain quite hypoxic despite us giving a lot of oxygen. Um, but they have a structurally normal heart. They can have these, you know, ductus and the foramen ovale open, but structure-wise, they have a normal heart. And sometimes, um, even if you see a lung disease, like for example, a meconium aspiration syndrome baby, or a baby having um, congenital pneumonia, when you see the x-ray, you can't believe that this baby is having this much of hypoxia. So that's why we say there's a component of hypoxia, which is disproportionate to the underlying lung disease. And then uh, the famous pre and post structure saturation difference, typically above 5%, but generally 10 to 15%. Okay, now there's a question for you. Um, try to think what is the pre and post structure saturation trend that you can see in PPHN? Uh, is it just the normal pre ductal with wide difference between pre and post, or both pre and post ductal reduced with no difference? Both pre and post ductal saturations reduced with a significant difference. Combination of one or three or all above. So Darshan, can you uh, Yes, madam. I'm running the opening the poll, madam. Uh, Any responses? Uh, you can tell me, right? Yes, madam. Doctors, can you see uh, 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 multiple questions coming in your window? You can answer it. Doctors, can you answer it, please? I received the answer for uh, option number five, madam. Okay, thanks. Okay, so all of them have chosen number five. Uh, yeah, no, one doctor chosen number five and one doctor chose number three. Huh? How about the others? What do you think? They are not permitted to answer in our chat. One doctor chose number two. Doctors, you can actually click and submit it.
you can click on the answer and you can submit it after us. I got another response for number three, madam. Option number three. Right. Um, so the correct answer is actually all about. So if you go back to the previous picture, so why I uh, why I wanted this question to be answered was like most of our trainees go away with the idea that PPHN can only present uh, whenever there is a significant pre and post ductal saturation difference. Okay. So some think okay only the pre ductal um, only the post ductal can go down, but the pre ductal can remain normal. Or some think, okay, the preductal and postductal can both go down, but there should definitely be a difference between pre and postductal saturations, which is not true. So if you carefully concentrate on this picture, um, if a baby is having a communication at the art uh, at the atrial level, okay, um, or at the VSD level, at the ventricular level, so what will happen is that the shunting from the left to right occur well above and well before the blood deoxygenated blood entering into the uh, ascending aorta okay so way way before it enters the ascending aorta there could there is a shandhi uh, happening at the level of the atria happening at the level of the ventricles so therefore even your pre ductal saturation could very well be low and if there is no shunting happening at the ductal level maybe the ductus is closed uh, due to some reason and if that happens uh, so you won't see a significant pre and post ductal saturation difference. All you see is a baby who is having a reduced pre ductal saturation, and uh, the post ductal saturation may may also be very low without a significant difference. But if you have a, a shunting uh, at the atrial level or the ventricular level together with the, with a significant shunting at the ductal level, then the, then the pattern you get will be a reduced pre ductal saturation with a significant difference between pre and post ductal saturation level, right? So if you don't have a significant shunting at the level of the atria, then what you commonly see is a normal pre ductal saturation, a slightly reduced pre ductal saturation with a wide saturation gap. I hope that's clear to you. Right. So moving on. So whenever you see a baby who is having low saturation or cyanosis, then you all you always panic, right? A newborn baby in front of you with significant desaturation. Then there are three things that come into your mind um, at once. Is it a significant lung disease? Is this cyanotic congenital heart disease? Or is this PPH? So we have to differentiate between these three because the management could be really different. So from the history, what can you get in lung disease? It has to get some history regarding a ruptured prolonged rupture of membrane or a mom having a cordial amniotis or maybe meconium aspiration then you know okay this is highly likely to be lung disease lung disease uh, so in cyanotic congenital heart disease there could be an antenatal diagnosis sometimes there is not so pphn you might not have any clue to the history so uh, when it comes to respiratory distress um, um, usually babies with lung disease they are having a significant distress in cyanotic heart disease usually they are not having any distress at all but in pphn this is quite variable uh, now uh, the oxygen saturation again lung disease uh, pre and post ductal both can go low but the important thing is it improves with supplemental oxygen there is cyanotic heart disease um, fixed low saturations would be seen in pphn the typical feature is that they have a significant differential uh, um, saturation and also very labile saturation so that means the more means the moment you uh, uh, the moment you stimulate the baby do something with the baby, do an intervention or anything, all of a sudden you feel, you see that there's a wide fluctuation of the saturations because they are very thick. Now, hyperoxia test, although it's shown in this table, is no more done now. Um, and then if you do a, a blood gas analysis, you see in lung disease, the CO2 level is elevated, whereas in uh, cyanotic heart disease, it's low. Um, and in PPHN, it could also be very high. 
and you can also see a component of metabolic acidosis in PPHN and sometimes in cyanotic heart disease, but not commonly in lung disease. Okay? So you know the features of the X-ray and also echocardiogram, which will be diagnostic in both cyanotic heart disease and PPHN. So if you do an echocardiogram in a baby with PPHN disease, what you will see characteristically, the septum will either be flat or it can be deviated towards the left side. Okay? Um, and then you can see the right ventricle is enlarged and there is a lot of blood regurgitating into the right atrium. And when you assess the flow pattern, you can see that there is a right to left shunt through the PFO. If there is a septum uh, defect here. You can see that there is a right, a right to left shunt occurring at the ventricular level as well uh, and also at the level of the PDA. And you can do, you can actually measure the pulmonary artery uh, pressures by using Dopplers as well. So this is what you see in the echocardiogram. Um, so I know um, getting an echo done in the middle of uh, the night is not the easiest thing. Um, it is not essential for you to perform an echo before start before starting the management for PPHN, but it's always better to have one if possible for two reasons. One is, of course, uh, echo is the golden gold standard to diagnose PPHN. And on, uh, on the other hand, you need to exclude congenital heart disease as well, particularly if you want to start some inhaled nitric oxide. This, is, this could be contraindicated in some forms of uh, congenital heart disease, especially if you want the pulmonary blood flow to maintain the systemic circulation. Therefore, it's always better to have an echo before you embark on the management. But if you don't have an echo, don't worry. We'll just work it out uh, how to do it. Right. right. Uh, so traditionally, uh, we talk about PPHN in term babies, but we all know that uh, preterm babies can also get PPHN. So there are two patterns in preterm babies. Some babies, as soon as they are born, uh, along with their uh, surfactant deficient lung disease, they can have an element of PPHN. And then the other pattern is, of course, as you all know, preterm babies, they can develop chronic lung disease with some oxygen dependency. And these babies also can develop a secondary pulmonary hypertension later on, which is mainly due to uh, abnormal remodeling uh, of the pulmonary vasculature. And this is a bit difficult to treat also. Right. So most of us have commonly seen uh, PPHN babies who are having a mild to moderate degree of PPHN babies. These are the babies who are having a little bit of a respiratory distress and maybe you diagnose PPHN with an echocardiogram when you request it just because the baby is needing some oxygen for a longer time that you would have otherwise expected. And sometimes these babies are picked up from the postnatal world, quite healthy babies, just because there is a significant pulse pressure difference when you do the pulse oximetry screening before discharge. So these are the mild cases of PPHN baby. So management is uh, easy. So it's just the provision of supportive care. If there's an element of you screen for infection, and if there's an element of infection, you treat with antibiotics. Um, usually they need a bit of oxygen supplementation in the form of uh, nasal strong oxygen, or maybe a, a bit of high flow or CPAP, and then you closely monitor them. Child. And sometimes they are started on some oral sildenafil as well. But when it comes to severe PPHN, then the management is quite different. And you have to carefully manage and monitor these babies because they can develop, they can get really sick and very difficult to manage if you don't handle the initial period properly. Okay, right. So if you ever have to uh, manage a baby having severe PPHN who is cyanosed and you are also panicking, baby is also uh, sick and the staff is also panicking, make sure, first things first, So it's, you start with your A, B, C approach, okay? Don't think about nitric, don't think about other things, inotropes, nothing. You just go for the A, B, C approach. So you intubate the baby, secure the airway, and then... Uh, get a good ventilation for the baby and then you do an x-ray to make sure the ET is well positioned and when you attach the ventilator you check the leak also there should be only a minimum leak okay less than 20 percent with a significant leak you can't ventilate the baby. and then Okay. Right. Yeah. 
and you aim to maintain uh, the normal temperature of the baby under suppose you are cooling the baby for hie component right? and make sure that you have to maintain normal electrolyte balance including sodium potassium calcium and magnesium why i have mentioned magnesium specifically here is this is something that we always forget and we all generally start antibiotics for sepsis and there should be a strict fluid balance now moving on to principles in ventilation and maintaining oxygenation of the baby it's very important that we optimize the baby's um, oxygenation as well as the carbon dioxide level because um, the co2 level ph of the artery artery blood as well as the oxygen level they are uh, they are the most important determinants of the pulmonary vascular resistance if the baby becomes hypercapnic if the pH drops or if there is a hypoxemia, then it's difficult for you to manage the PPH. So how we are going to achieve all these targets is by providing optimum lung inflation. Okay. And also, if you, ha if you have to use uh, inhaled nitric oxide also, there is no point in you starting um, nitric oxide if you don't, if you haven't provided optimum lung inflation. So remember that principle and you need to use your oxygen liberally but um, nobody actually knows what is the uh, 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 the appropriate target range the general understanding is that it's better to keep the pre-doctor around 92 percent to 97 percent in that range why we are choosing that range is that we know below 92 percent the, the pulmonary vasculature can go into spasm and also, if you like aim for like 100% oxygen, then there is again a, a theory that there could be development of oxygen-free radicals, which is again toxic to the pulmonary vasculation. So we try to maintain this balance. Okay. Um, and the carbon dioxide should be maintained at the normal level. Generally, a permissive hypercapnia is not tolerated at, uh, at the early phases of managing, management of PPH. And if there is a significant lung pathology going on, uh, like in a congenital pneumonia or meconium aspiration, it's always better to consider uh, provision of surfactant because that then it's easier for you to ventilate this lung. Okay. So remember, when we talk about oxygenation, in our, when we are ventilating a baby, if we are struggling with oxygenation, what are the determinants? It's your mean airway pressure. Uh, which is determined again by P, PIP and the I-type and also by the FiO2. Now, one mistake that is commonly done uh, happening in the neonatal intensive care unit is that you just adjust the PIP and PIP and you always forget to look at the I-type. So generally, we are, I mean, most of the time we are ventilating preterm babies and for them we keep the I-type very low, something like a 0 0.35, 0 0.4. This is totally inadequate for big term babies which should ideally be above 0.45 okay so make sure that you uh, keep the eye time uh, uh, correct as well okay so in case if you need to use very high peeps then it's admissible to consider uh, HFOV, uh that is high frequency oscillation ventilation so uh, i'm not going to touch uh, the principles of high frequency oscillation ventilation now it's beyond the scope right but make sure whenever you are ventilating a baby you might have to do x-ray serially to make sure that lungs are maintained properly expanded if you under expand the lungs if the lungs remain uh, atelectatic then again you cannot maintain oxygenation at the same time if you hyper expand the lungs remember that's going to worsen your pphn as well so if you see this picture in this x-ray, you can see how many ribs. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Almost 11 ribs you can see. And you can see that the diaphragms are flattened here. And also the media stimulum is quite flat, uh, compressed. So this is a typical chest x-ray of a hyper-expanded lung. So ideally, you should only see about 8 to 9 rib spacer posterior ribs in a chest x-ray which is adequately expanded so if you see something like that in a pphn baby it's very important that you try and come down in the mean airway pressures because this is not going to help you at all 
because the pulmonary vessels which are running in these hyperexpanded lungs, they are going to get squashed and your PPHL, the co component of PPHL is going to get burst. Yeah. So make sure that you don't let this happen. Okay. The next important point is to make sure that your blood pressure is maintained appropriately. So remember, having an invasive blood pressure monitoring is quite useful in this time. How can we monitor the invasive blood pressure in a, treater, in a newborn? Is by using your umbilical artery catheter. It's very easy. So in this, uh, whenever a baby is having a, a PPHN component, remember there is shunting of blood from the pulmonary artery into the, uh, into the uh, aorta. So we need to aim for suprapulmonary pressures in the systemic side. So just maintenance of the normal neonatal blood pressures is not going to help you at all. So even for a term baby, you cannot aim for a, blood a map of 40. That's the usual aim for another baby, for, for, for babies with other conditions, right? So if you are struggling with PPHN babies, it's generally you might have to maintain the map around 45 to 50 for a term baby. If you have an echocardiogram, it's easy. Then it's, what you have to do is you can measure the pulmonary artery uh, pressure and then you aim for suprapulmonary uh, systemic blood pressure for that. Uh, but if you don't have, again, it's okay. You just keep an eye uh, at the uh, pre and post ductal saturation difference. And if you see at a certain blood pressure level, if uh, the gap between pre and post ductal saturation uh, gets, you know, uh, lesser and lesser, that means um, the shunting gets diminished at that pressure level. So you try to maintain the blood pressure above that level. Okay, so that's how you. Uh, generally manage a PPHN baby without an echocardiogram. So how can you maintain this blood pressure? Yeah, we have to go for fluids. Um, so we can give boluses, but make sure that you do not go beyond 20 to 30 ml per kg of normal saline boluses. This is not going to help if you keep on flushing just the saline into the system. You have to use inotropes to help with the blood pressure of these babies. Now we are coming into the second question. What is the first line inotrope in babies with PPHN? Is this dopamine, dobutamine, midrenone, or noradrenaline? Yeah, Mr. Sudarshan. Yes, madam. Uh, I have launched the question, madam. Can you try to answer it? Madam, I have received the answers for first, second, and fourth options. First, second, and fourth options. Fourth options. Okay, right. All right. Um, so the correct answer is, of course, dopamine. The first line inotrope in PPHN as well, common to all the newborns, right? So I will briefly go through the inotropes which are available for us to use. Uh, because uh, you need to know the action of the inotrope if we are to maintain appropriate blood pressures in a baby with PPHN. So why we choose dopamine as the first line agent is that it has a, got an inotropic effect. That means it increases the carb um, uh, cardiac output. But remember that's at doses of 5 to 15 micrograms per kg per minute. So there is no point in you just going up, up, up to 20s uh, if you see a baby with hypotension. Okay. Uh, so after this 10 to 15 mics per kg per dose, there's a severe vasoconstriction happening. And then that's not going to help you at all. And then you have epinephrine. It's a potent inotrope, right? So at very higher doses, it will cause vasoconstriction as well. So first you start with dopamine. And then if you are really struggling, uh, then you need to do an echocardiogram. If you see um, a, a, a poor contractility of the heart, this is what you need to start, some epinephrine. Moving on to NORAD, so it doesn't have any inotropic uh, action. So it doesn't improve the cardiac output as such, but it's a pure, it's a pure vasoconstrictor. 
So in the echocardiogram, if you see good contractility in the heart, but your blood pressure is low, that means the problem is at the periphery vascular resistance. So at that instance, you have to use a vasoconstrictor. How about dobutamine? So it has inotropic effect, but it generally does some vasodilation. So the response of the blood pressure response to newborn is highly variable. They can, dobutamine can increase, sometimes decrease, or sometimes there might not be any response at all. But remember, dobutamine is associated with increase in, in tachycardia most of the time. So generally, it is not helpful at all in this setup. And one other helpful drug is milrinol. It has got a beautiful ionotropic action and it has got a pulmonary vasodilator effect as well. Uh, so it's very beneficial in the management of PPHN and we'll discuss about this later. And then we all have hydrocortisone which will come and save us when we have run out of all other options. Okay. So I was talking about echocardiograms which is right on the second line um, second line inotope but if you don't have an echocardiogram don't worry again uh, we have a getaway um, so if your systolic blood pressure is low with a narrow pulse pressure that means your heart is not functioning well and in which case you must use adrenaline but if your diastolic blood pressure is very low with a wide pulse, pulse pressure that means uh, there's a peripheral vasodilation in which instance you have to use norad okay so that's how you determine which inotrope to use next. Okay. Now, uh, so that's your A, B, C. Then you have to come to other issues in your D. So make sure um, you do frequent blood gases. And if there is a metabolic acidosis, you have to correct it to maintain the pH at the proper level. So this is one of uh, the very um, rare instances where you try to sort of give bicarbonate and keep the pH in the normal range. We generally uh, discourage the use of bicarbonate. And we always tell the trainees, if you have a metabolic acidosis, please look for the reason and try to treat the reason rather than treating acidosis with bicarbonate. It. But here, because the pulmonary arteries get irritated with acidosis, we tend to treat these babies with bicarbonate just to maintain the pH in the normal range. Right? Yeah. So these babies, they can get really irritated and irritable, and uh, any stimulation of the baby, any pain or any procedure happening to the baby um, can increase the pulmonary vascular resistance. Therefore, it's very important that you start proper sedation and analgesia for these babies. Right? So you can use either morphine or fentanyl initially given as a bonus and thereafter starting an infusion. And if you need medusalam to sedate, you can use it as well. Uh, with regards to muscle relaxation, um, generally you should avoid muscle relaxation unless the baby is really fighting with the ventilator and you are struggling to ventilate the baby or oxygenate the baby, right? So uh, because muscle relaxation has been associated with increased mortality, therefore try to avoid if possible. But if you are struggling to ventilate, then there is no option. You might have to relax. But the problem when you are using high uh, doses of sedation and muscle relaxation is that the blood pressure can drop. So if that happens, make sure that you go up in your inotropes or fluid boluses and try to maintain your blood pressure in the range that we discussed before. Okay. Now we are coming um into another question uh so if i want to give you a scenario this is a term baby born by emergency cs uh, lsds with a significant meconia baby is born in good condition however soon developed significant respiratory distress and this is worsening now and you admit this baby to nicu on CPAP. and then subsequently due to desaturation the baby ended up being intubated and we ventilate the baby with pips of 20 p5 FiO2 is 100%. But the preductor sap is uh, 85% with a map of 38, and this is your x ray. Okay. Have a look at the x ray. Okay. What will you do? I have given you a couple of options. One is to start nitric, one is to increase the fluid bolus. One and two, and then two and three. What would you do? The ball is running, madam. Okay, thanks.
I have the answer for option one and two, and also uh, two and three also, madam. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so some of you want to start nitric oxide here, uh, but some think uh, just to go up in the fifth and fluid bolus, which is the correct answer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if I'm to go back into the X-ray to see that yes, I'm struggling with my oxygenation. It's eighty-five percent. But if you look at the other parameters, the mean um, arterial blood pressure is also 38. So here I am struggling with a baby with meconium aspiration. But can you see in the chest? I can see features of meconium, but how many ribs? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just seven ribs, which is quite inadequate. So this is a baby who is having um, a electric lung. So this lung needs to be inflated more than this. Right. So even if you start nitric oxide, that's not going to work in this lung. So definitely you have to go up in your PIP in this instance. OK. And also, as you uh, as you know really well now, uh, the map of a 38 is not going to help you, even though this baby is a term baby, because we are dealing with a component of PPHN here. So you have to go up um, in this. So the correct answer is increase in PIP. And then you will give a fluid bolus initially because it is the initial stabilization. You are not going to start inhaled nitric oxide straight away. Okay. So yes, basics before high tech. Okay. So if you if you find a baby having PPHN, don't just panic and run around looking for nitric oxide. There are a lot of things that you can do before that. So you have to make sure that your uh, um, eating is okay, properly positioned. Uh, there is no air lead, uh, your inflation pressures are okay, and your chest x-ray, right? Uh, and then the fluid status of the baby and make sure uh, the baby is having is well perfused and having a good uh, map, okay? So you do all that, you sedate the baby, if needed, paralyze the baby, and then even if you are struggling, then you think about pulmonary vasodilator. Okay, so what are our options? So after doing all the initial stabilization, if you are still struggling to oxygenate this baby, then of course, without delay, you have to think about think of starting pulmonary vasodilator. So there are a couple of options. Uh, so we have to inhale nitric oxide now in all level three um, neonatal units, including where I work, Kalabovila. Uh, uh, and then we also have magnesium sulfate, uh, sildenafil, as well as milrinone. But remember, or nitric oxide is the first line therapy. So talking a little bit of theory about nitric oxide, it's produced, uh, uh, synthesized in the endothelium of the lung uh, from L-arginine, and it's uh, catalyzed by a nitric oxide synthesis. And this diffuses into the vascular, a smooth muscle cells, and they are activates the guanyl uh, cyclase, and um, this leads to a formation of cyclic GMP, and cyclic GMP promotes pulmonary vasodilation. What is the evidence for nitric oxide? So in term babies, we all know that it's safe. And when we use it for PPHN, it improves oxygenation and it reduces the need for ECMO. There are no long, I mean, no significant short or long-term adverse effects. It reduces mortality. But the benefits of nitric oxide is not very clear for babies who are having diaphragmatic hernia. On the other hand, if you take, if you look at the data regarding preterm babies who, who receive nitric oxide, unfortunately, we haven't got many data or randomized clinical trials looking at the effect of nitric oxide on preterm babies. However, there are some case reports describing okay. We have used nitric oxide in baby in preterm babies having PPHN, and we have seen good results. So we all go by that. So generally, what we see is those babies who are born with uh, uh, with a history of prolonged rupture of membranes, and as a result, having oligohydramnios, and those who they are the ones who are generally going to benefit with nitric oxide. Um, with regards to the adverse effects, there have been several concerns whether usage of nitric oxide increases the uh, incidence of uh, IVH in these babies and also whether it affects neurodevelopment. But 
generally we don't have much data about this. So the general consensus is that if you are really struggling to oxygenate a preterm baby and if you are pretty sure that this baby is having PPHN, you just give it a try and see. If the baby responds, yes, uh, we are all lucky. If the baby is not responding, you just stop it. Okay. So that's how you do with the preterm babies having PPHN. Okay. Uh, looking into some practical aspects uh, with regards to nitric oxide. So, uh, so after you stabilize the baby and after you look into those basic things that I have mentioned before, then you calculate the oxygenation index. I hope everyone is familiar with the calculation. You do it um, by multiplying mean airway pressure by FiO2 and then you divide it by the post-ductal partial pressure of oxygen. And I hope you know how to get the mean airway pressure also from the ventilator. It's very easy when you see the ventilator screen, it's displayed. Okay, so you don't have to get, uh, you know, uh, it's not rocket science, uh, you, um, no big deal. You can just look at the ventilator screen and get the mean airway pressure. So that's how you calculate the oxygenation index. So after optimizing all the other things, if your oxygenation index remains about 20, then you need to strongly consider starting nitric oxide. But remember, this should be a consultant decision um, uh, because this is, um, a, a, I mean, um, it's um, it's not really available and it's very expensive, right? So even in foreign, even in UK, it's a decision of the consultant to start nitric oxide. Okay. So when you start it, you start it at uh, 20 minutes, minute, and that is the dose that you need. So you start with the maximum dose and then you slowly come down when the baby is stable. So when you start it, you can't just start it and go away. You have to situate the baby and then assess the response within 20 to 40 minutes. So you need to repeat the calculation of the oxygenation index. So typically if the baby is responding, the oxygenation index should come down. And if that is difficult, if obtaining blood gases is difficult, then of course you can um, check the pre and post after saturation difference to see if that is improving or to see if you can come down in the FiO2. So if, so if the nitric oxide is going to help you, it will help you within the first 30 minutes, right? And if it is not, uh, if, it, if it has not done any change, please stop it. Don't waste nitric. And uh, literature, in the literature, we find that methemoglobinemia, thrombocytopenia, and coagulopathy are associated with uh, usage of nitric oxide. But at the doses of 20 uh, particles per minute, we generally don't see this side effect. So not to worry that much about those. Unfortunately, about 25% of the babies with PPHN do not respond to nitric oxide. Then we need some rescue therapies as well. So then your sildenafil is, comes in very handy. Of course, it, always the intravenous mode is better than the oral mode, but unfortunately, it's not available in Sri Lanka. But you can still use the oral sildenafil in a dose of about 1 to 2 milligrams per kg QD test. And it definitely improves oxygenation and reduces mortality. And uh, this has sh been shown in studies as well. And particularly important, in, um, it has been in low resource areas. And then, of course, you can use mil uh, uh, mildrinone as well. Now, uh, sildenafil, um, usually the benefit you can see in babies with preserved cardiac function. Okay, So if you are really, if, if there is a cardiac dysfunction, if the contractility of the heart is poor, then sildenafil will not help you. Um, help you, yeah. But on the other hand, if you are having a baby who is having myocardial dysfunction, then rather than going for sildenafil, then you should try a little bit of milrinone in this baby as the second line treatment. But although I said um, it is an uh, it has got inotropic effects and pulmonary vasodilatory effects, there is some element of systemic vasodilation as well. Um, so you might have to consider a saline bolus prior to commencement of mildrinone because you tend to see a little bit of a drop of uh, systemic blood pressure um, very soon after you start mildrinone. That is something for you to remember. Okay. So finally, um, if you uh, when you do the echocardiogram, if you feel that uh, the, the ductus is closing and you are struggling with the oxygenation and also the right ventricle is also dilated, 
then our only savior is somehow to maintain the ductus open because if the ductus is open um, even if the right ventricle is having a pressure overload that uh, we can release that pressure by helping to shunt across the ductus into the aorta although there is a mixing of blood there that is very helpful for the right ventricle right um, because it's just acts as a valve, valve and then um, it helps to release that excess pressure of the right ventricle so maintaining the pda is quite helpful for us in babies with pdhn so in a baby who is deteriorating if you see that the ductus is closing and you are struggling with oxygenation you can always try our prostaglandin um, and that will help you to reopen the duct and will definitely help you with uh, the management Okay, our good old friend magnesium sulfate. Unfortunately, so when I was a registrar, which was not many moons ago, so we have been generously using magnesium sulfate for babies having PPHL. Yes, we did see some good response, but the problem we saw was the moment we start the babies on magnesium sulfate, the blood pressure started crashing. And then you have to keep on you know uh, giving inotropes going up and starting and adding one after the other so therefore the it's generally not recommended to use magnesium sulfate in pph and babies because now as you all know we should maintain the delicate balance between the systemic and pulmonary blood pressure okay there's no point in you going down i mean uh, being able to go down reduce the pulmonary pressures if your systolic pressure is also drop um, so there is uh, the systemic in the systemic release. What they say is there is no data for us to recommend magnesium sulfate. Uh, what they advise us is to just uh, probably not say, right? So okay, let's assume we are winning now. We have done the basic stabilization. Uh, we have done a wonderful job in lung recruitment, and we have maintained blood pressures really well. And we started some nitric and now we are winning baby is improving pulmonary pressures are coming down okay now one is thinking okay how am i to do weaning of nitric oxide okay weaning when the baby is on nitric oxide for some time it could be at times tricky really tricky to wean nitric because there's a very high risk of rebound pphn when you try to come down in the nitric okay? so you have to consider only when the baby is absolutely clinically stable and also make sure your MPIO2 is below 60%. If it is above 60%, don't even think of coming down in the nitric. Okay. So when the baby is stable, FIO2 below 60, you come down in the nitric oxide by five uh, particles per minute every four hours. So you come, come, come down very slowly. Okay? And you come down until five. And thereafter, you come down by one every four hours. So that's very slow. And it's always better to get a repeat echo assessment soon after successful weaning from nitric oxide to make sure that the pulmonary pressures remain low. Right? So sometimes what we see is when we come down in the nitric oxide, all of a sudden there is an increase in the oxygen requirement or there is widening of the pre and post structure saturation difference. So that means if that happens, there's a failure of weaning. So all you have to do is to go back to the previous nitric oxide level and to maintain that for some time. And then again, when the baby is stable, you can try and come down. Okay. Sometimes recurrent. I mean, this this problem ha happens recurrently, and it's very difficult to wean from the nitric oxide. And then you might have to start some adjuvant oral sildenafil as well, uh, in addition to nitric oxide. And then you will be able to come down in the nitric oxide. Okay. ECMO is the final resort for a baby having PPHN. Okay, but only a minority. Very minority of babies would need ECMO. So those who need ECMO would keep on needing, uh, keep on having very high oxygenation index above 40 continuously despite maximum treatment. And they generally have a component of cardiac dysfunction, hypotension, and they rapidly deteriorate. So there is some eligibility criteria which apply. It has to be a term baby. There shouldn't be a um, Irreversible respiratory failure, uh, there shouldn't be any significant congenital abnormalities, and there shouldn't be any interventricular or intracerebral hemorrhages. Okay? 
uh, but availability is a big question because in Sri Lanka only one center offers the queue. Even in UK, although there are multiple uh, level three units uh, having inhaled nitric oxide, only several units have ECMO facilities. So it's a very um, limited facility everywhere in the world. And it is associated with significant uh, uh, complications as well. Okay. So even if you have won the initial period and you have successfully managed the baby with PPH, and remember, they can have uh, long-term neurodevelopmental uh, problems, cognitive abnormalities, and also hearing abnormalities. So make sure you keep the baby in your loop and um, provide um, neurodevelopmental assessment and follow-up even after discharge. Okay, so that brings uh, to the end uh, of my lecture. Uh, so just to summarize before uh, we wind up, yeah, so if you have a baby having a clinical and echo evidence of PPHN, you go through your ABCD, and then you can, if your INO um, oxygenation index is above 20, then you consider nitric oxide. At the same time, you maintain your blood pressure above 45. After starting nitric oxide, if you are still struggling, uh, then you can consider starting some sildenafil if the ventricular function is okay. But if you have right ventricular dysfunction, then you need to start melvinone. If the duct is closing, then you consider prostaglandin. Okay? And then there are a lot of things you can do for your blood pressure as well. And the final resource is ECMO. But remember, never forget your basics, A, B, C, D, E. Okay?